in the room? Is my microphone working? No, okay. Um, hello, is this better? I think this one's better, right? Okay. Let's try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. I want to welcome you to FDA's patient-focused drug development meeting on alopecia areata. My name is Meghna Chalasani, and I work in the Office of Strategic Programs within the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research here at FDA. I will serve as the discussion facilitator for today. Dr. Tatiana Usova will provide some opening remarks in a few minutes. But first, let me start by asking my colleagues sitting here in the front to state their names and their role within the agency. Kendall Marcus, Director, Division of Dermatology and Dental Products. Jill Lindstrom, Deputy Director, Division of Dermatology and Dental Products. Tatiana Usova, Deputy Director for Safety, Division of Dermatology and Dental Products. Melissa Reyes, I'm a medical officer with the Division of Dermatology and Dental Products. Hello, I'm Neil Ogden. I'm the branch chief for the General Surgery Devices Branch 1, and we review light-based technologies. Melinda McCord, clinical reviewer, Dermatology and Dental Products. Michelle Campbell, reviewer, clinical outcome assessment staff. Hi, I'm Teresa Mullen. I direct the Office of Strategic Programs in the FDA Center for Drugs. Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, Graham Thompson, Office of Strategic Programs. Pajita Vaidya, Office of Strategic Programs. And I think we also have a few other of our Office of Strategic Programs colleagues outside, Shannon Woodward as well. Um, now to give you all a brief overview of the agenda today, after Tatiana's opening remarks, we will first briefly provide background on our PFDD initiative and on alopecia. Then we will move into our discussion with those with alopecia and their family members. Our two main topics are health effects and daily impacts of living with alopecia, followed by current treatment options. I will provide some more details about that format at the start of that discussion. We have time set aside for open public comment later this afternoon. While the primary discussion today is focused on dialogue with those with alopecia and their family members, the open public comment session will give anyone in the audience the opportunity to make a comment. To participate in that, you will need to sign up at the registration table. Participation is first come, first serve, up to 15 commenters. We'll close that sign up at the end of our break around 3 p.m. The time allowed for each speaker will depend on the number of participants who express interest, likely one to two minutes each. For a few logistic and housekeeping points, there is a kiosk outside where bagged lunches, snacks, and beverages are available for purchase. Please feel free to bring your food inside the meeting room. Restrooms are located right behind the kiosk. At any point, if you need to get up for any reason, please feel free to do so. As I mentioned, we will be taking a 15-minute break around 2.45 p.m. This meeting is being transcribed and a live webcast is being recorded, both of which will be archived on our website. As you may have noticed, there are a few media outlets also recording audio and visual. We appreciate that there is a lot of interest in our meeting today. We too believe that this is an important meeting. We have a documentary filmmaker and several photographers, including FDA photographers, to capture this meeting. Please note that if you are asked to participate in an on or off camera interview, you may accept or decline that invitation at your own discretion. Now, I would like you all to join me in a moment of silence to remember all of those affected by the 9-11 attacks 16 years ago. Thank you. Our thoughts are also with all of those affected by Hurricane Irma this past weekend. With that, I'd like to welcome Tatiana for opening remarks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this meeting on patient-focused drug development for alopecia areata. I'm Dr. Tatiana Usova, and I'm the Deputy Director for Safety for the Division of Dermatology and Dental Products in the Office of New Drugs uh, at the FDA. Our division reviews drugs for the treatment of der dermatologic conditions, including alopecia areata. We are happy to see so many patients, caregivers, and advocates in the audience. I understand we also have uh, many more of you joining us remotely from the web. Thank you all for being part of this meeting and sharing your experiences with us. We are pleased, pleased to have this opportunity to engage directly with you and to learn more about the symptoms and health effects that matter most. 
the impact that alopecia areata has on your daily lives, and what factors you take into account when selecting a treatment. We believe that it is absolutely critical that patients with alopecia areata and their caregivers have the opportunity to share with the FDA their unique perspective on living with this disease and different concerns about treatment of this chronic relapsing condition. Your insight on benefit risks, tolerability of treatment, and additional needs is truly important to us. Alopecia areata is an autoimmune disease that causes hair loss. The hair loss usually occurs on the scalp, but can also affect the beard, eyebrows, and other areas of the body. Dr. Melissa Rice from our division will provide more background on the condition and current, current treatment options in a few minutes. Alopecia areata is a serious condition with physical, emotional, and social impacts, and we recognize that there is an unmet need for patients. When FDA approves a drug to be marketed, it is our responsibility to ensure that the benefits of a drug outweigh its risks. Therefore, having this kind of dialogue is extremely valuable for us because hearing what patients care about can help us lead the way in figuring out how to best facilitate drug development for alopecia areata and understand how patients view the benefits and risks of treatment for alopecia areata. Uh, for example, what we hear from you today can help us understand how to develop better endpoints for clinical trials to measure those aspects of alopecia areata that are important to patients. I know we also have representatives from industry, academia, and other government, government partners in the room and on the web. While FDA plays a critical role in drug development, we are just one part of the process, and I'm glad to see a high level of interest from those of you who also play an important role in the drug development process. FDA protects and promotes public health by evaluating the safety, effectiveness, and quality of new drugs, but we do not develop drugs or conduct clinical trials. Drug companies, sometimes working with researchers or patient communities, are the ones who conduct trials and submit applications for new drugs to the FDA. It is then FDA's responsibility to ensure that the benefit of a drug outweigh its risks. We are all here today to hear the patient's voice, so thank you all for your participation. We are grateful to each of you for being here to share such personal stories, experiences, and perspectives. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Teresa Mullen, uh, who will talk about the FDA's patient-focused drug development efforts. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, with each, with each of these meetings, I usually try to just give a few minutes of context for why we have these meetings. Uh, and when we came up with the idea, which we discussed, we found was a very good idea to have, have these meetings to hear from patients. And so uh, five years ago, it's hard to believe it was that long ago, but we were reauthorizing the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, which is how the FDA Center for Drugs and, and Biologics gets most of its funding for uh, supporting new drug review. And, and we make commitments to things we're going to do to enhance the program during those, those five-year cycles. And so, you know, five years ago, um, basically, we were hearing from patient groups, patient stakeholders during our negotiations, and they were wanting us to better incorporate their views. And so without having a clear idea at that time, we committed to, uh, to do this. So we thought we'd need a more systematic way to get the patient's perspective uh, and not just uh, one or two patients in advisory committee meetings where those people have to undergo conflict of interest screening and a lot of other things. So we can't hear from the wider community. Um, we really wanted to hear the broader patient's voice because we knew that that was really critical to doing a good assessment of benefits and risks. I mean, after all, the patients are the ones who are going to be taking these drugs. Do they work for the patient? They're going to experience any risks associated with it. So we really need this information in our benefit risk assessment straight from patients, and so we thought this would be a way to uh, get it without having to do that conflict of interest screening, do it by disease, not going focusing on a particular drug. So at that time, uh, we committed to, uh, 
to, to do at least 20 of these meetings. And basically, the review divisions and patient groups between our own internal people and patient groups wanting to have this more. We've had 24 instead of 20. This is the last month of that program, uh, for the last user fee program. So now we're going to reauthorize and move on to the next authorization of PDUFA, where we have commitments to further move this program forward and develop guidance so people know what to do with the kind of information that we get in these meetings. So we'll look at this information, but it's to give the community more tools and information about what to do next to take what we hear today and build on it uh, so that we have richer trials that better incorporate the patient's voice as well. Here are the diseases that we've covered over the past five years. This is our second to last one. We have one more on September uh, 25th. For those of you uh, who are, don't, don't live in the government, you know, September 30th is the end of our fiscal year. So that's just coming right down the wire in terms of that last meeting. But you can see it's a very wide range of diseases. And every one of these meetings has provided us with things we didn't know, insights, things we never saw in the literature, because that's written by the professional people and don't necessarily have the views that people have the disease. So it's been very enriching for us. And every time we run one of these meetings, we take what we learn and put that into a what we call voice of the patient report. Now, it takes us a little while to produce these reports, because not only do we collect and uh, get the transcript from this meeting and our notes that we take ourselves in this meeting, but we leave open the docket so we can get submissions of information from people on the webcast or other things that may occur to people in the room or on the web that you'll send to us after this meeting, because it'll occur to you that that might be helpful as well. We put that information together uh, to develop these reports that have been extremely valuable to us. They both serve as an immediate way to capture as authentically as we can what we heard today and the way we heard it from you. And uh, to not only provide that to reviewers going forward when they do get uh, drugs or there's a sponsor that wants to do a development program in this area, we can use it as a resource for ourselves. We've heard from companies it's a very valuable head start for them in trying to develop ideas for uh, patient reported outcomes in a disease area. And also, we've heard from patient groups that they have found it valuable as well. So we, we will certainly be producing that in the coming months after this meeting. And we're very much looking forward to hearing from you today. So with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? No. Another one. All right. Hello? Oh, better. So my name is Melissa Reyes. I'm a medical officer with the Division of Dermatology and Dental Products. Um, I'm also a pediatric dermatologist by training. So it's very exciting for me to see so many of you here today. Um, you know, I look forward to hearing your experience because we often make decisions on what we think is important for all of you when we do our risk-benefit determinations, but to actually hear your comments, it'll be something concrete that we can then take back with our um, regulatory decision-making. Now, uh, today, I'm just going to be giving an overview on alopecia areata. It's really just to set the stage um, for the discussion that's going to come ahead. And so I'm not going to delve too much into the scientific literature. It's really um, going to be more background information. So. Just briefly, we'll go over the clinical features of what makes alopecia areata distinct. Um, we'll go over who it happens in, so that, that's epidemiology. And then being an FDA, we'll talk about the treatment options available. And then most importantly, we'll talk about the impact of the disease on quality of life. And that's why you're all here today. So alopecia areata, as you know, it's a disorder of the hair follicles. It tends to happen in three different patterns. So there's focal, total, and general. It can affect the nails as well. In these photos, you can see two individuals who have alopecia areata of the focal pattern. So you can present with a single hairless patch, or you can have several hairless patches. Sometimes it can progress, and sometimes you can have regrowth with new patches forming. In the progressive form, you can have it progress to clinically identifiable patterns, such as on the left, which is euphysis. You have hair loss that's limited to the posterior and the inferior hairline. Or you can have the converse, which is called sisypho, which is you have hair on the bottom, but you lose it on the top and on the back of the scalp. In cases when it progresses to complete hair loss, it's called alopecia totalis. 
And if you have complete hair loss, it, the condition is called alopecia universalis. And this is where you have eyebrows, eyelashes involved, as well as the body hair. Now, in terms of nail involvement, the reports of nail changes vary based on the study, but 10 to 38% of subjects in the studies report that there's some kind of nail finding. This is one of the more common. If you can appreciate the nail pitting, there's small indentations or pits that make the nail plate look a little bit rough in appearance. Now that we know how alopecia areata can appear, this is who it happens in. So it's generally accepted that 0.15% of the US population has alopecia areata. This amounts to approximately 490,000 individuals who have it at this time. Most individuals have onset by the time they're 40, and nearly half have onset before the age of 20. Studies vary in terms of gender distribution, but it's likely that it, it happens equally in men and women. Now, I see a lot of young faces here today, so this might be relevant for you. In children, the mean age of onset is between the ages of 5 and 10 years old. So typically in alopecia areata, the more common is the focal pattern where you have a hair loss patch and then over the year you have spontaneous regrowth over the year. But there are other cases where it does progress. And so there are studies that show that if you have onset of disease before your 20th birthday, you're more likely to have a severe disease pattern. In studies that look at alopecia totalis and alopecia universalis, most of these individuals actually had an appearance of symptoms before the age of 30. So there are a lot of gaps in terms of what we know about alopecia areata. And I'm going to show you next what we do know about it. So this is the most scientific of my slides, so please be patient. But I wanted to give you a look at what happens on the cellular level. So on the left is a hair follicle from a normal um, individual scalp hair. And on the right is from someone who has active alopecia areata. So to orient you on the left, the pink and purple structure is the hair strand. It's connected to the skin at the very bottom, and that's the hair bulb. So you can see on the right, in active alopecia areata, you have a lot of little purple dots. Those are the inflammatory white blood cells, and those are the cells that are disrupting the hair bulb. That's where your hair grows. So if you don't have the hair growth, you end up shedding the hair, and that shows up as hairless patches on the body and on the scalp. So being an inflammatory process, most of the treatments were anti-inflammatory in nature. Um, and so that brings us to treatment. So currently, there are no FDA-approved treatments specifically for alopecia areata, but treatments are done, obviously. Um, and these are mostly treatments that are approved for other indications. So these are topical and systemic treatments that are used off-label. Being off-label, we actually still rely on expert guidance and consensus in order to manage patients with alopecia areata. And I provide a list here of some of the peer-reviewed guidelines that are published in the scientific literature. So in terms of treatments, it's usually divided by local versus systemic therapies. So by far the most common is corticosteroids topically or injected intradermally into the skin. So these uh, types of medications can happen as creams, ointments, gels, and solutions. Second line treatments are, are calcineurin inhibitors, immunotherapies, and minoxidil, which is a hair growth stimulating solution. And in the literature, there are also reports of many other types of treatments that are tried in alopecia areata. So these include prostaglandin analog solutions, platelet-rich plasma patches, topical retinoids, cryotherapy, and light-based therapies such as eczema light. Local treatments are usually used as a first line or for people who have limited involvement. In terms of systemic therapies, these are considered for patients who have more extensive involvement of hair loss or if they have a really rapid onset of disease. Um, or if they have a really progressive disease. And so again, steroids play a part being one of the major anti-inflammatory medicines we have. And this is typically given by mouth or can be given intravenously. Immunosuppressants are medications like cyclosporine, methotrexate, sulfasalazine, um, and azathioprine. And more recently are the immunomodulators. So this includes TNF-alpha inhibitors, JAK kinase inhibitors, and apremolast. Also in the literature are systemic retinoids and statin-based medications. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the treatments for alopecia areata, majority of them are not approved specifically for alopecia areata, but are used under expert guidance. Now, the real reason why we're here is the impact of alopecia on quality of life, and so I wanted to share some data um, regarding that. So there are studies that show that there are, is a social, um, psychological, and economic impacts due to the disease on individuals. 
Um, one study showed that up to 40% had a lifetime prevalence of having general anxiety disorder um, and major depressive disorder. There's also data that suggests that the adult experience is very different from the pediatric experience. So the pediatric population tends to bear a much bigger burden of the psychosocial impacts of alopecia areata. Now, compared to other skin diseases, alopecia areata is not as well known as eczema or atopic dermatitis um, and psoriasis, which has gotten a lot of publicity as well. But there are studies that show that the health-related quality of life of patients with alopecia areata are actually decreased to the same amount as people with eczema and psoriasis. In light of this, I wanted to share a statement from the Cochrane Review called Interventions on Alopecia Areata. And so they quote that there's a desperate need for large, well-conducted studies that evaluate long-term effects of therapy on quality of life. So to conclude, that's why we're all here today with us. We are aware that there's an unmet medical need that you all face in terms of treatment specifically for your condition. Um, and so for this meeting today, we look forward to hearing from you directly hearing from your caregivers and your family about the experience of alopecia areata because it will help us with our regulatory decision making. Um, and thank you again for taking the time. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michelle Campbell and I'm a reviewer of the clinical outcome assessment staff we're a group here at an Owen in the Office of New Drugs that looks at outcome assessments that are used to see how a patient feels, functions, or survives. And so this is really where the patient voice comes into play. So you may be wondering how the information that we use in these patient-focused drug development meetings, and what, what do we do with them? Where do we go from here, and how do we take this valuable information and create clinically relevant and patient-focused endpoints for clinical studies? And I hope I can answer some of this in the next few slides. At the FDA, we believe that patient-focused drug development meetings are very important to provide the opportunity for individuals and caregivers' voices to be heard. Today, you will be sharing your experiences with alopecia in your own words, letting us know the symptoms and impacts that are most important to you. Drug companies want to hear this perspective because it can help them give ideas on what to measure in clinical studies. They can select or develop questionnaires that measure these important concepts and engage with the FDA as they develop treatments. The information from these means can also help support the FDA review of clinical trial questionnaires to confirm that they are adequately capturing the individual's and caregiver's perspective on health outcomes. While the patient-focused drug development means provide useful information, we strongly recommend that drug companies and other researchers obtain additional input from individual and caregivers using focus group or one-on-one -on -one interviews, as well as from physicians and other experts to develop their questionnaires. This will help us confirm that questionnaires should include important and relevant information and that the questions and instructions are clear and understandable to those who will complete them. Another advantage of these meetings is that they help us think about the clinical, clinical study endpoints. So what is an endpoint? In the case of a questionnaire, the study endpoint will be how the questionnaire score is going to be measured and analyzed in the clinical study. For example, if individuals with alopecia are reporting the most important benefit of treatment is symptom improvement, then we would use that information to encourage a drug company to select, a, select or develop a symptom questionnaire that meets regulatory standards. The study endpoint could possibly be the change in the questionnaire score during the clinical study, which would measure the amount of symptom improvement. I should note that we know today we're going to hear many things will be discussed. Um, however, we know that every, not everything will change um, with treatment, and it could be difficult to interpret results if these concepts measured in clinical trials for approvals. So if we're measuring something, for example, such as financial well-being, it may be hard to detect a benefit from that from the, in the clinical trial setting, even though we know that is important to you. We encourage drug companies to consider focusing on important concepts that are most likely reflect, reflect the effects of treatment as key endpoints in the clinical trials. 
At the FDA, we have to uphold laws and regulations. With these regulations, there are regulatory standards that require assessments like questionnaires to generate responses that, we, that are well-defined and reliable and will not potentially lead to misleading, um, be able to be described in a misleading way in labeling. To ensure this, we ask that drug companies gather input from individuals and caregivers through interviews and focus groups to develop these questionnaires. And this is really where we capture our patient voice. We also ask them to form the appropriate statistical testing to support questionnaire development. These methods help demonstrate that the questionnaire is measuring the right thing in the correct way and that the score is accurate and reliable so that any positive change on the score can be reinterpreted as a symptom improvement due to treatment. We recommend that drug companies start the process of selecting or developing questionnaires and seeking the input of the FDA as early and often throughout the drug development process. And this will ensure that they gain experiences um, with the instrument during the drug development process before they proceed into the phase three clinical trials. So how can you engage with the FDA and how can drug companies and researchers come and talk to us about selecting or developing questionnaires? Currently we have three pathways enable to you to come and discuss with the FDA on your clinical outcome assessments. The first pathway on your left is what we call our traditional pathway, and this is through the um, individual drug development programs, and this would be with an individual drug company where they would come and talk with the clinical review division during their drug development um, and discuss possible endpoints, outcome assessments, and what to measure. The second is through our drug development tool, Clinical Outcome Assessment Qualification Program. This is outside of an individual drug development program and is voluntary. This allows instrument developers to come together with patients and other groups and to engage with the FDA to develop an instrument um, to be able to support multiple drug development programs. Um, and part of the result of this would be having a qualified clinical outcome assessment. Again, this is a voluntary program, and that qualification is not a requirement to use a clinical outcome assessment um, in a clinical trial. The third pathway is the critical path innovation meetings. Again, this is outside the individual drug development program. It is a meeting that is, um, provides general um, CEDAR specific advice. It brings together uh, a different uh, members of various offices in CEDAR. Um, to talk about novel or early stages of development, and this is a way to get input on direction to go, and these meetings are non-binding. We know that patient-focused drug development meetings are a starting point for developing a patient-focused outcome measures and endpoints, and that the outcomes of these meetings will support and guide FDA risk-benefit assessment in the drug reviews. We know that individuals and caregiver input ultimately helps determine what is measured to provide evidence of a, of a treatment benefit, how best to measure concepts, and what a meaningful improvement is in treatment. I thank you for that, and here are some resources for you. I now turn it back over to Megan so we can start discussion for this afternoon. Thank you, Michelle. So our goal today, as we start this discussion portion of our meeting, is to really foster an open dialogue on personal experiences and perspectives on alopecia areata. Our two main topics for discussion are health effects and daily impacts of alopecia, followed by current approaches to treatment. We will kick off each session with a panel of individuals and family members. There are five for the first topic, and I will ask at this time for our topic one panel members to come to the front, please right up here. After the panelists, we will broaden the dialogue to include other individuals and family members here in the audience and on the web. We have about 150 participants right now joining us via webcast. The purpose is to build on the experiences shared by the panel. I'll ask a number of follow-up questions, inviting participants to raise their hands to speak. My FDA colleagues may also have follow-up questions. We will have staff floating around with microphones and they will come to you. Please state your first name, and just your first name is fine, um, before speaking, 
For transparency, we also request that at the time of your first comment, that you disclose if you're affiliated with an organization that has an interest related to alopecia, or if your travel here today has been funded, or if you have significant financial interest in alopecia drug development. Please keep your responses focused on the specific question or topics at hand and limit it to a minute or so. We have a very large crowd here today, so I am going to ask that you raise your hand and speak if you have something to add to the conversation. If you agree with a particular perspective or experience, please feel free to nod your head or clap your hands. We will have some polling questions today. Um, we ask only that only individuals with alopecia or a family member or a caregiver responding on behalf of an individual with alopecia respond. If you're in the room, you'll see these very fancy clickers. Uh, they were originally on your chairs. Hopefully, you haven't lost them yet. Um, <laughs> Um, and for those on the web, we do have a platform and you will be able to respond via the webcast as well. Um, so as far as the clickers, um, when we have, we'll have a few test questions coming up, but basically when you submit an answer for some questions, you can select only one. For some of them, you'll be allowed to submit multiple answers. You'll feel a little buzz almost, and that means that our system has captured your response. And we have a few trial questions to test this out for everyone. These polling questions are not a scientific survey at all. They're truly just to be, they're meant to be a discussion aid for today. For those joining us via webcast, you can also add comments to the web platform in addition to participating in the polling questions. Although they may not all be read out loud today, our co your comments will be incorporated in our final summary report. As Teresa, Teresa mentioned earlier, we also have a public docket for this meeting that will be open until November 13th. We encourage you to share your experiences and expand on what we discussed here today through the public docket. The comments will be incorporated into our summary report as well. Anyone is welcome to comment through the docket, whether you're here today, joining us via the web, or you know someone who wasn't able to participate today, but you think they have something to contribute. Please encourage them to submit their comments. You will find the link on the slide here, and we'll also email this link as well as the slides to folks after the meeting to everyone who's registered via the Eventbrite website. Engaging with patients is very important to us here at the FDA. If you're interested in learning about more opportunities to engage with the FDA, please reach out to our Office of Health and Constituent Affairs or our Professional Affairs and Stakeholder, stakeholder Engagement staff. Their contact information can be found here on this slide. And as I mentioned, we will be posting these slides publicly after the meeting. A few ground rules for our discussion today. We are here first and foremost to listen to those with alopecia and their family members. We will try to accommodate everyone who wants to speak. If we don't get your full thoughts on a topic, we encourage you to elaborate in the public docket. We are happy to see participants here today who represent research and drug development. We believe that the input we hear today will be important for you as well. We just ask that you stay in listening mode. Some of you may have requested to participate in the open public comment, and we look forward to hearing your input at that time. FDA staff is really here to listen. We know that you may have questions about drug development or drug review. If you have specific questions, we encourage you to write them down on a piece of paper or an evaluation form, which you can find on the tables outside, and we'll get back to you with more information following the meeting. As has been described, our discussion today is focused first on the health effects of alopecia and daily impacts, and then approaches to managing those health effects. Our discussion may touch upon scientific treatments. However, the discussion of any specific treatments should be done in a way that helps us to understand the broader issues, such as what health effects are being addressed and how meaningful is that to patients and individuals and family members. The opinions expressed here are personal opinions. Therefore, demonstrating respect is of paramount importance. We very much appreciate what complex and personal topics we are addressing in this public meeting, and we expect everyone here and on the web to share this appreciation with us. We want your feedback on the meeting. What we learned will help us to continue to design and implement patient-focused meetings that are useful to FDA and to individuals and their families. There are evaluation forms on the tables outside, as I have mentioned, and we encourage you to fill those out during the break or after the meeting. With that, let's begin with a polling question. So folks in the room, take out those fancy clickers. Our first question is it's a pretty simple one. Where do you live? A, within Washington, D.C. metro area, so including the Virginia and Maryland suburbs, or B, outside of Washington, D.C. metro area. Does everyone in the room have a clicker? 
all the individuals or family members. If you don't, please raise your hand and we have folks that can bring you a clicker. Okay. I see a few more responses still trickling in here. Let's give it a couple of seconds. Okay. Let's see. Oh. Let's try a second one. This is why we have these trial questions. Let's go to the second one. Oh, there we go. Oh, we got it. Okay. So 77% of you all traveled from outside of the Washington, D.C. metro area. Thank you. I know it's not easy to get to White Oak, Maryland. And then 23% of you all are more local. Okay, so our next question, please. Have you ever been diagnosed as having alopecia areata? A, yes. B, no. Sixty-five percent of you, yes. Thirty-five percent of you, no. So going forward, I am going to ask that it's one um, clicker response or clicker per individual with alopecia. So hopefully the thirty-five percent of you are answering on behalf of someone with alopecia. Next question, please. What is your age? A, younger than six years old. B, six to twelve years old. C, thirteen to seventeen years old. D, 18 to 29 years old, E, 30 to 39 years old, F, 40 to 49 years old, G, 50 years old or older. Yes, yes. Yes, please answer on behalf of the individual with alopecia. Yes, one more question. Oh, they're not working. Can we get some more clickers, folks? Please let us know if you're having any challenges with a clicker. I should, like I said, do a little buzz or a little vibration right after. Anyone else having challenges with the clicker? Okay. Okay. Wow, I think we have a very nice range of folks in the room here today. So we have 4% um, younger than 6 years old, um, around 15% um, between 6 to 12 years old, 13 to 17 year old, and another 15%, 18 to 29 years old. Um, and then we have a nice range um, in the other age ranges as well. 28% of you all are 50 years old or older as well. Thank you. I think we have one more polling question in the demographic section. Oh, a couple more. Do you identify as A, female, B, male, C, other? Okay. <laughs> Girl power here today. 75% female and then 25% male, 1% other. Okay. I think we have one more actually polling question. Okay. Where is your alopecia areata located? And so this is a question that you can um, select as many that apply. Um, a, scalp. B, beard, sideburns, or mustache. C, eyebrows. D, eyelashes. E, all areas. F, other areas not mentioned, such as nails. Please check all that apply. Oh, it's still not working. <laughs> Can we try another one, Sarah, please? Okay. 
We have a really nice mix here as well. A um, little over half of you indicated that you have alopecia located on your scalp. Um, less than 10% beard, sideburns, or mustache. Um, close to half percent eyebrows. 34% eyelashes. 63% who said all areas, so A through D, um, as well as the whole body. And then 31% said other areas not mentioned, such as nails. Okay, I think we have a very nice range. I'm going to turn to my colleague Graham and see what the responses on the web are looking like. We asked them the same exact question. The responses on the re uh, web are very similar, although we have 78% say that they're affected on the scalp. Um, and we had about 57% say that they've been diagnosed as having LP areata. Thank you, Graham. Okay, with that, thank you all. Um, let's start with our first panelists now. Um, I'm just going to turn to Liz, and then we'll just go straight down. Hello. My name is Elizabeth DiCarlo. I was diagnosed with alopecia areata at age 13. As one of six children, I am the only one in my family with this disease. It started with a bald patch on the back of my head the size of a quarter. During that year, it became larger and eventually connected with other bald patches and turned into total loss of hair in my head. I wore a wig to my eighth grade graduation. I have no photos to share at this time because I avoided being photographed. It was very traumatic. I looked different. I felt different. I was about to enter high school wearing a wig. Thank you. <laughs> I was always worried that someone would pull my wig off or find out about my hair loss. Three years later, my hair grew back, not 100%, but I didn't need to wear a wig. The hair that grew back was the same texture and color as my original hair. I had hair from my senior photo. I was happy and regained some of my confidence. Throughout my 20s, bald patches the size of a quarter and sometimes larger would come and go. I would cover them up with brown eyeshadow or spray on hair paint and lots of hairspray. Wind was my enemy. When I met my now husband, it was difficult for me to tell him that I was losing my hair and that I had a disease called alopecia areata. I never shared my secret, secret with anyone except my immediate family. At the age of 30, I lost all of my body hair. When I looked in the mirror, I did not recognize the person looking back at me. I had no eyebrows to give structure to my face. I wondered how my husband could love me when I looked like this. I avoided social events like going out to dinner or meeting up with friends. I was depressed and angry that this happened to me. Work life was difficult. I avoided conversations with coworkers, especially when they talked about hair. I always felt that people were talking about me. In 2009, I overheard an insensitive colleague questioning if I was in some sort of religious cult because she noticed that I had no eyebrows or eyelashes and that I was wearing a wig. I left work in tears. I didn't know how I was going to handle the situation. I did not want to go back to work. With the support of my family, I decided to confront my colleague the next morning and educate her about my condition. After 30 years of struggling, this was the best decision I ever made and gave me the confidence to tell others about my disease. However, my disease still prevents me from seeking a new career path because I worry that I may have to face that situation again. While well, I've come to terms with my condition through my involvement with the National Alopecia Areata Foundation as a support group leader, I still struggle with the daily physical part of drawing on eyebrows and fixing my wig. The emotional part is somewhat better, but I still deal with the physical part. Excuse me. I love to swim, but I don't swim anymore because I'm embarrassed to swim with no hair and concerned that my eyebrow makeup would come off. Excuse me. When I'm at a sporting event and I'm wearing my hat with hair, I pretend I have to use the restroom before they sing the national anthem. As I get older, I think about the burden of this disease about applying eyebrow makeup every day and finding a wig age appropriate and affordable. I worry if I decide not to wear anything on my head, will people avoid me because they think I might be sick, have cancer, or something contagious. I worry about other illnesses due to the lack of hair to filter out particles in my nose, eyes, and ears. 
Alopecia is always on my mind and never goes away. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my story. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. And now we have Harrison and his mother, Sarah. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Carr Evans. And for those of you who are parents in the room, will appreciate that you go to great lengths to not have tears in front of your kids. And this is one of the few times that mine has seen any. I am sincerely grateful for your invitation to be here today. Our family is here today as a first step in our own transition from victims to valiant warriors, fighting against a disease state that lies in wait, unwilling to tell us when it will strike again. We hope Harrison's story will emblazon your spirit, excuse me, and compel you to suit up and join us in this battle that we intend to win. And so I begin. My husband David and I have the most amazing son. Two of them, actually. One who is hopefully quiet in the back room, and the other who is our seven-year-old Harrison that is sitting here with me. Harrison experienced complete hair loss across his entire body, scalp, eyelashes, and brows at two and a half years of age. His hair loss is attributed to a genetic predisposition that was coupled with a viral trigger. After the first hair loss, Harrison's lashes grew back fully and parts of his scalp and body experienced regrowth as well. Around eight months after the initial regrowth, he experienced another full hair loss. We have been on a cycle of regrowth followed by hair loss ever since. Neither traditional nor non-traditional treatments have reversed his condition. Harrison is no longer receiving any physical treatment. We are focused exclusively on ensuring his emotional, social, and spiritual health. For this is our choice to be here today to support those aspects. And again, we want for Harrison to feel empowered, not victimized by this ailment. There are several physical challenges that Harrison experiences because of alopecia. For instance, athletic effect activities are affected. Helmets do not fit securely on his head and are exacerbated when he begins perspiring. Sweat, then combined with sunscreen, which is of course necessary to protect his pale bald scalp, exacerbates this condition and situation. To that end, sunburn is another important physical concern. Since Harrison has very fair, sensitive skin on his, on his scalp, and we live in a typically southern sunny southern state, we must apply sunscreen to his head on a regular basis, especially in the summer. His teachers often apply or reapply sunscreen before recess and PE, which draws additional attention to his condition. When patches of hair grow back in, the sunscreen sticks to his hair, which can be uncomfortable. While the physical challenges are, of course, a nuisance, it's the emotional and social challenges caused by alopecia that are our greatest concern. For instance, there is non-malicious treatment by children and adults. Harrison is often erroneously defined by himself and others as ill or sick because of his physical difference. He experiences unusual social cues or reactions from strangers, such as strange faces and exceptionally long glances, as well as special treatment because people believe that he has a life-threatening disease. This behavior, though well-intended, will draw, uh, draws to us unwanted focus on this condition. Further, this special treatment implies that there's something wrong with him. While these are kind gestures in theory, they're internalized by Harrison as reinforcement that he is ill or different. Also, there is a concern that Harrison will be resented by his peers and others for some sort of special treatment or favoritism that he inadvertently receives because of his condition. In addition to the non-malicious treatment, there's, of course, the malicious treatment. 
by adults as well as children. My child has been called directly to his face, Baldy, in other incredibly hurtful names. I have watched as adults refuse to course correct their children when they have said such hurtful things. Name calling is sometimes malicious in its, its intent, but other times there are children who simply believe they're playing around when they call him names or remove his hat from his head unwantingly. He is often reluctant to say anything to them because he doesn't want them to believe he is hurt by their choices. My greatest concern as a caregiver is that the impact of this disease will have significant effect on his confidence, his self-esteem, and his self-confidence. Specifically, I worry that Harrison will fundamentally believe that he is sick and is less capable than other people around him. Harrison is the most amazing little gift from God. He is compassionate, he is funny, he is thoughtful and curious, he is artistic, athletic, and spiritual, and most importantly, he is strong, physically and emotionally and spiritually. We desperately want for the world around him to experience him because of these amazing traits and not through the lens of a physical difference caused by alopecia. Again, we are so deeply grateful for your interest in this disease state and for inviting for us to be here today. We believe God chose Harrison as a vehicle for change. He and we feel called to lend our voices to this fight against alopecia and all autoimmune disorders. Our armor is on. Our words and swords are drawn, and we intend to win this war. Please join us in this battle. Thank you so much for your time and your interest. Thank you, Sarah and Harrison. Next, we have Samantha. Hopefully, I can get through this without crying. Um, I definitely felt everything that Liz had to say, and it, I teared up when she was speaking. And it's difficult to explain um, 20 years. I'm sorry. It's difficult to explain 20 years of your life in three minutes. Take a moment, it's okay. <sighs> Sorry. <sighs> My name is Samantha Cunningham. I'm a wife and mother to three beautiful little girls. I've had alopecia for 20 years. <sighs> I started losing my hair at the age of 14. I was getting ready to graduate from the eighth grade and was attending the largest high school in Detroit, Michigan. Over 5,000 kids in the high school. My hair loss started in May with a penny-sized shiny spot in the back of my head. By July, I was completely bald. And by December, I had lost all of my eyebrows, lashes, and body hair. Over the last 20 years, I've never had complete regrowth. My, my eyebrows typically grow in every couple of years and stay in for a couple of months. And I've only had regrowth on my head when I was pregnant. And that regrowth consists of very fine white hair that I would consider peach fuzz with no real length to it. And it would fall back out six to eight weeks postpartum. Over the last 20 years, I've dealt with a compromised immune system. I was never a sickly child before alopecia. Now, no matter the amount of vitamins I take, I'm guaranteed to become sick if something is going around. I've been hospitalized several times for the flu, pneumonia, strep throat, and a variety of other things that may not cause hospitalization in a normal person. This affects my life because I'm not always able to spend the amount of time I would like to with my children. Being diagnosed with alopecia at such a pivotal, pivotal time in my life has definitely affected it. I withdrew from all of my elementary school friends. I spent that first summer in the house. I refused to leave. 
I cried myself to sleep at night and I suffered from severe depression. <laughs> I often hid in my house, in my own house from people because when they would come to visit, I didn't have a wig on. I judged my relationships with people based on whether or not they knew they know that I have alopecia. I have family members that I have distanced myself from because I couldn't explain what was happening to me. I love the amusement parks, but haven't been to one since I've lost my hair for fear that my wig would come off on a ride. My children have never been to an amusement park. I'm always mindful of outdoor activities and how often, and I often ride the sidelines over playing with my children. I also feel as though I cannot be seen as a professional at work if I don't have my wig on. On my best days, I live a normal life, but on the worst, I'm severely depressed and my own worst critic over my appearance. Um, what you have to understand is that often, African American women are defined by their, are defined by their beauty. Whether or not you're light skinned or dark, whether you have good hair or bad, whether your hair is long or short, and although people may or may not believe in these things, society does. How does society define a 14 year old girl that has lost her hair very quickly and has had no time to process it herself? My greatest fear is that my three beautiful daughters will one day lose their hair and mommy won't be able to explain why. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Samantha. Next, we actually have comments from Deirdre Nero. Deirdre um, is located in Miami, Florida. I'm not sure how many times she rescheduled her flight, but her la latest rescheduling was trying to get her here by 11.30 a.m. Unfortunately, the airports are closed and she wasn't able to join us in person. However, she did send us her comments, and so my colleague Sarah Eggers will be reading on, be on her behalf. Just kind of hold it. Just hold it with you. Yeah. Again, my name is Sarah Eggers, and I'm speaking on behalf of Deirdre Nero. And I'm reading her comments exactly. Hello, my name is Deirdre Nero. I'm an attorney and live in Miami, Florida. It has been 19 years since I first found the bald patch on my head that would completely change the course of my life. It was during my junior year of college while blow drying my very thick, long hair. Little did I know then that the significant impact alopecia areata would have on my life. I am now 40 years old and have been living with some form of this autoimmune disease for almost half my life. I started with alopecia areata, patchy bald spots at age 21. For about nine years, it was just patchy. Sometimes I had just one or two small patches, and then other times I had lots of patches and or large patches. At age 30, I lost all of the hair on my scalp, alopecia totalis. And around age 35, I lost all of my hair everywhere on my body, alopecia universalis, including leg hair, arm hair, pubic hair, armpit hair, all scalp hair, nose hair, eyebrows, and eyelashes. I've never had a single form of alopecia. I've had every single form of alopecia and experienced what they were all were like. At times, my hair was inexplicably started to grow back in a very patchy and random fashion on my head and parts of my body, only to fall out again for no apparent reason a perfect example of the completely unpredictable course of this disease, which can cause significant emotional distress. I would not define my condition as well managed. Right now I have zero hair on my body. For a time I was able to keep eyebrows and some eyelashes by getting steroid injections directly into my eyebrows every four to six weeks and by using latisse on my brows and lashes. About a year ago it completely stopped working and I lost all, my, all eyebrows and eyelashes. When I lost my eyebrows and eyelashes, I suffered the most. Your eye, eyebrows and eyelashes not only protect your eyes, but they add character, definition, and expression to your face. Without eyebrows, your entire face changes and becomes unrecognizable. Not recognizing yourself in the mirror is a very difficult thing to deal with and causes an identity crisis. Having no lashes not only make your eyes look small and strange, but also cause problems such as constant discomfort in the eyes. 
I always feel like I have sand or debris in my eyes. I also lost my nose hair and have a lot of issues with runny nose and sneezing. Taking allergy medicine every day does nothing to help this problem. This disease has changed me. It changed my life, my mind, and my heart. It made me weak and vulnerable, battered my self-esteem, and heightened my insecurities. As a woman, a lawyer, and a business owner, I strive to present a confident image to the outside world. I spent many years in constant fear of being discovered as a bald woman, fear, fearing being thought of as sick, bizarre, ugly, or worse. I worry that I will always be like this and never be normal again. It is very difficult to live your life feeling different and abnormal. I worry that my partner will not find me attractive. I worry that if I ever have children, I will pass this disease to them. I worry that if I do try medications, that they will have terrible side effects and I will get sick, or maybe they just won't work and I will have spent a lot of money and gotten my hopes up. I don't like to swim, go to the beach, do, or do sports or exercise. Wearing a wig during these activities is pretty much impossible or at least uncomfortable. So in order to do these things, I must, I need to be bald. Sweating is uncomfortable as it pours directly into the eyes since I have no eyelashes or eyebrows. Being bald outdoors can be painful, especially since the head skin is very easily burned, even when wearing a lot of sunblock. As an adult woman, 40 years old, living with alopecia since 21, one of the most significant impacts has been on my love life and sexual and romantic relationships. Living in fear of being rejected, not found to be attractive, unfeminine, etc. I have a wig fall off during sex, which makes you not want to wear it at all. But then I've also had a man ask me to wear a wig for sex because without it, they don't find me sexually attractive. As you can imagine, it is devastating to experience and hear these things and makes the entire prospect of having a healthy sexual relationship seem impossible and stress-inducing. It is something we don't talk about much because it can be embarrassing, but it is such an important part of life for an otherwise healthy adult woman. This is a disease that not only alters the way you see yourself, but the way the outside world sees you and treats you. For me, it has been a constant battle. There hasn't been a day since I found that first patch 19 years ago that I have not wanted to scream or cry when looking in the mirror or thought that I am damaged, abnormal, unfeminine, or ugly because of my hair loss. Not a single day that I haven't worried about how a client, colleague, friend, or love interest might see me and judge me. Many say to me that it is only hair, or at least it's not cancer. These comments, while often well-meaning, are insensitive and usually make me feel even worse. It is a disease that has a tremendous physical and emotional burden, which is often not well understood by those who are not experiencing it themselves. I want to thank the FDA for giving the alopecia areata communi community the opportunity to discuss these burdens in this forum and hopefully help give the medical community a better understanding of what it means to be living with this disease. And on behalf of Deidre and Nero, thank you. And now we have Mega. So I wanted to start off by saying thank you guys for, so much for like choosing us and letting us talk about our story. But, so, I just want to ask some simple rhetorical questions. When you go to school or work, what do you do? Before you meet a person, what is something last minute you do? Before you step out of your car, what do you do? These, the, the answer to the sim these simple questions is adjust your hair. Now to say alopecia is not a big deal, well then that's the funniest joke of 2017. Because having alopecia is one of the best and worst experiences that a person can ever have. My name is Mega Thyagarajan. I'm in ninth grade, 14 years old. I've had alopecia since first grade. The only hair left on my head is, so to say, baby hair, has a soft texture, and the amount of my hair is so very few, it's like a newborn's head. Even when I did have hair, it didn't grow past my shoulders. My mother shaved me once, but it never grew past that. Now, many of you understand the emotional roller coaster alopecia provides and the impact it gives to a person. I want to share with you my experience and what I personally went through. When I got alopecia, I was around six years old, soon turning seven. Now, at a very young age, kids don't understand sensitivity. People always came up to me and yelled, 
Are you a girl? Why don't you have hair? You look weird. Of course, at such a young age, I can't explain my condition, and their insults hurt. My best friend even dropped me with the words, I don't want to be your friend because you're bald. And that, the way that hurt is unexplainable. Without hair, the feeling difference has always been there. I put up barriers, refraining myself from be, being coming close to my friends. I pretend like I'm the most confident person, but the simplest things hurt me. I believe people regard me differently due to my hair, or the lack of hair. And that makes me feel terrible about myself. My personal relationships have always depended on the fact that I don't have hair. Although, after all that pain and emotional scars, I've never had the thought of wearing a wig. Wearing a wig has never been a solution to these ever so constant, constant problems. My self-confidence has risen, yeah, but I couldn't, and I couldn't care less what others think of me. I go to school with a wig that isn't combed and untidy once a year just to make fun. I make jokes about being bald on a constant basis. Yeah, it has changed me as a per person, and I'm describing that it can be good, but the amount of times I've thought about self-harm and just not existing in general is unexplainable. I blame so much things, such as my cockiness, how I'm irritating, annoying to, the reason, to alopecia. I believe my personality has become different, and I wouldn't be the same without hair. So due to that fact, I have many emotional conflicts with my hair, and many don't understand how hard it is to talk about it. I'm frequently called a boy. When I was, I'm on the ski team, I was listed as the last girl. The professionals started asking my coach, are you sure this is a girl? And then one other experience, I was in the bathroom. One woman came in and she's like, is this the ladies room? She saw my mother and then just shut her mouth up and went to the stall. See, those are simple things, but they hurt me so much. It strikes me emotionally a lot and sometimes I can't handle the pain. So as I said, I've refrained from many things on an emotional level to do, due to alopecia. I stopped karate. I stopped so many different events because I had alopecia, because I was so scared about how people would judge me. There have been times I've broken down and cried for hours at an end, wondering why I even deserve a life. But all in all, I try to surround myself with positivity so others can understand it isn't always miserable. For people with this condition, getting the right doctor and right treatment is the key to a positive outlook. My biggest worry is when I grow up and I dream about finding a person to spend my life with, go on adventures with, and just live as happily as my parents do. When I need a partner that no one is going to find me attractive, or, and personality will mean nothing, as looks will always mean more. No matter my success, I won't re be regarded as beautiful or pretty or even come close to that type of status. Recently, wearing makeup lets me have a fake exterior of not being as ugly as I believe so. This condition, even though I've never regarded it as something bad, I reason it will cost me so many things. The world is changing and beauty is becoming so important. My fear is that I'll have to change who I am just unnaturally to be accepted, to hide my condition as there is no cure, to wear wigs. Changing who I am is definitely something I don't want to do. So if there is no cure, maybe this future holds hiding your true self is good for image, and I would never be myself again. Changing who I am is a worry greater than I could ever fear. Overall, alopecia has a great impact on everyone, whether you have this condition or you live with someone who does. It changes who you are, whether people realize it or not, and a cure needs to be found because it's never something you should take lightly. Hello. Thank you, Megan. Can we have one more round of applause for all of our topic one panelists, please? Thank you. Thank you all, and to our panelists again. So by a show of hands, how many of you heard your or your loved one's experiences reflected by the comments that we heard today? Wow. For those of you that are on the web, everyone's hands just went up. Great. Thank you guys so much again. 
So to get us started with our afternoon discussion, I'd like to look at one polling question to get us started. The first one we're going to ask that it's the responses are provided by pediatric and young adult individuals with alopecia. Um, a caregiver or family member can respond on behalf of an individual. So what aspects of your alopecia, Ariada, are most bothersome to you? So for this question, please feel free to choose up to three answers. A, patchy hair loss. B, widespread hair loss. C, location of my hair loss. D, repeated episodes of hair loss and regrowth. E, unpredictability of when or where hair loss will occur. F, skin sensitivity, such as to sun, temperature, or sweat. G, itching, burning, or stinging. H, brittle, spotted, pitted, rough, or rigid nails. I, other health effects that may be associated, such as thyroid disease. We will ask the same question again for the adults in the room with alopecia, so feel free to start thinking now. Okay, let's see. So we have 56% of you that said the most bothersome aspect of their alopecia is the widespread hair loss. Then we have 41% that said um, skin sensitivity, such as to sun, temperature, or sweat. That's very, very important for us to hear. 39% said unpredictability of when or where hair loss will occur. And then we have a nice range for all of the other aspects as well. I'd like to ask the same question of the adults now in the room. The same question, please. So for the adults, what aspects of your alopecia areata are most bothersome to you? Okay, we have a nice range here as well. Similar to what we heard from the pediatric and young adults, 56%, um, so the most bothersome is the widespread hair loss. And then once again, similar to what we heard from the younger uh, folks in the audience, we have 53% that, that mentioned skin sensitivity to sun temperatures, such as sun temperature, sweat as being the most bothersome. After that, we have 42% for location of hair loss as well, and then a nice range as well. Very interesting, thank you. Thank you all for participating. So I'd like to spend some time expanding upon what we heard from our panelists. All of them, especially Deirdre, um, talked about her patchy hair loss. Is there anyone in the audience that, like, that would like to kind of speak a little bit more about this aspect and how it's most bothersome to you? Should I stand? Is it on? Okay, thanks for bearing with me here. Doug is the first name. Thank you. Came here from Denver, Colorado for this meeting. Welcome, Doug. So um, I would just say just a couple things. I've had the condition for nine years. It's resulted in a loss of a marriage, my career, and two of my family members no longer speak to me. It has been a personality change. It was a appearance change. So um, the National Cancer Institute says 39% of the population will have cancer in their lifetime. Um, there are hundreds of FDA approved cancer treatments. Um, there are zero approved FDA treatments for alopecia. So a little tough love for the drug companies and the folks that have a nice job and a pension is, is that this is more than statistics, this is lies. And friends ask me why I don't fix it. I say there's no money in it. We're in no person's land. There's no money in alopecia treatments for, and it's a business. So I would say maybe an alopecia X prize or some type of contest may start invoking some interest and maybe 
a curious new approach to a therapy. So sorry to be a little stinging in the comments, but I think um, you know this is a challenge to really make a direct connection. And um, charts and statistics and things are fine, but if you're experiencing it, it just seems like another data exercise. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do want to highlight that this is not a scientific survey. It's just meant uh, as a discussion tool, mostly just to help me ask you the right questions. Um, a couple more comments on the patchy hair loss. I think we have oh, one right here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Danielle. And Conley. We are from Arlington, Virginia. And I actually have two sons that have alopecia. Connolly was three when he was diagnosed, and I have one at home who is currently three, and he was two when he was diagnosed. And both of them have alopecia areata. And I want to echo what uh, Sarah and Harrison have experienced here. And I want to say that watching your child go through alopecia is one of the hardest things you'll ever go through. And I don't want to cry in front of my kid, but um, it tears you apart. Watching your son get in the bathtub and the hair just come out and fill the water and it go down the drain and you can't do anything about it. And you go to the doctor and you look for a solution. And they say, try vitamins, change the diet, try an injection. We don't want an injection. I don't want to put something in my child's head that's going to hurt him. I don't want to give him a vitamin. I want something that he can take and will actually stop the hair loss, but not stop his growth. And I want to do something for him that's going to help him in the long term and be something that's not going to be something he's going to have to do for the rest of his life. And I want something that's really going to be able to make a difference in his life without being a long-term solution that he's going to have to take every day. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. That's really important. And we will be spending um, a lot more time in the second half during the topic, too, hearing from you all what you really want and what would be really meaningful um, in regards to treatment options. Um, one more comment on the hair loss. Hi, my name is Julie. Um, my hair fell out when I was 11. And it's come out, come and gone for years, but mostly gone. Um, and uh, I look around and I see all these beautiful bald heads today. And I just, I actually, I'm really jealous because I wish it was all gone. I wish every hair on my body would leave and that I wouldn't have to constantly manage my hair. Because it's you know, the mole hair, the chin hair, but nothing else, you know. And it affects relationships. You know, we don't have romantic relationships because I'm concerned about what is he going to think. I don't pursue, you know, I have to, he has to be something special to even think about it. But I'm generally, a, it's not worth the effort. And... Um, and, and generally, I don't think about it because it's, I have way more important fish to fry, you know? And it's just hair, and you put it, you know, you, you, you bury it deep, right? Um, but the patchy hair loss is a major issue. Thank you, Julie. I think you've raised a very important point that we actually uh, read a lot in the comment summaries that you shared with us. So I'm going to ask for a show of hands for those in the room. How many of you, when you experience your patchy hair loss, your preference would almost be that it would just all be gone, as Julie said? It's better to have it all or nothing. OK, wow. Uh, for those on the web, I want to say around 50 hands went up really quickly. OK, thank you so much for that, Julie. Thank you. Um, could we hear from folks a little bit about the skin sensitivity, such as to sun, temperature, sweat? I know Sarah spoke about Harrison's experiences. A couple in the back. Hi, my name is Mia. Um, my mom and I, we came from Midlothian, Texas today. And um, I'm currently a junior in high school, and I'm in the marching band. And it's, um, sorry, at the beginning of marching season, um, I was expecting the summer to be really, really hot. And so we were trying to prepare for that. And so we stocked up on sunscreen and hats, which are 
very, very annoying to me. I don't like having a hat on my head, um, especially when I'm doing something that requires or something athletic to where I'm sweating because then it gets really irritating and it rubs against and it's just annoying to me. But I noticed recently with football season starting, whenever we go out to perform in our marching show during halftime, the hats that we have to wear, they don't stay on my head because of the sheer amount of sweat that comes out because I don't have anything to like hold it in. and It gets into my eyes and um, just... That's a really big thing for me is that um, I can't do some of these things because I can't go swimming and I have like a swim cap that, you know, like Olympic swimmers have to use so that way like my head doesn't get burned in the water. And so that's just something that's really important to me. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have one comment here. Hi there. Um, I'm Maria. I uh, live in Delray Beach, Florida. Um, also a member of, of the board of the National Alopecia Arrieta Foundation. That's my, I guess, my full disclosure. Um, I, I have uh, patchy alopecia. I've had it since I was 14, um, so I can certainly um, you know, relate to many of the comments that were made. Um, as far as the skin issues, that's one of my biggest issues uh, beyond the hair loss is I have extremely sensitive skin uh, to the sun, to fragrances. Uh, it started probably when I was uh, early 20s. I had eczema very severely. And over time, I've been able to kind of keep that under control. But I am extremely sensitive to the sun to the point, and it's unfortunate because I live in Florida. Um, but I do have to be very careful uh, to wear a sunscreen of SPF 70 and above. I, my preference is 100. Um, but I also do break out if, um, you know, from fragrance in lotions or, um, uh, you know, detergents or even soaps. I have to be very careful. So it's just, it's just, something I definitely attribute to the alopecia. Thank you, Maria. Do we have, we'll take one more comment here. Sure, two. My name is Bob, and along with a full disclosure, I'm the chair. A little closer to you. Just hold it up a little closer. Oh, uh, I'm the chair of the board for the National Alopecia Areata Foundation. And I have had alopecia areata uh, universalis since I was three. And I won't tell you how many years ago that was, but it, it's more than 60. Um, in my childhood and young adulthood, and even later than that, I was foolish enough not to think that I would ever have sun-damaged skin. I now go to my dermatologist twice a, twice a year, and he freezes sun-damaged spots off my head. Uh, you might notice that I have a number of obvious ones that he just treated last week, coincidentally. Uh, I think there were 12. I think inevitably I will have skin cancer because I don't think you can get all of it off. I've damaged too much over the years. And it's something I never thought about, nor my parents ever thought about. But it is something for all of us to think about with our kids. And one second comment, just very quickly. I heard it said twice. My biggest fear as a parent is I'm going to pass this on to my children. <laughs> and that really hurts. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. And I think we're taking one more comment from right behind Bob. Hi, Cheryl. I'm from Northern Virginia. And full disclosure, I work with very closely with the National Alopecia Areata Foundation. Uh, so skin sensitivity. My skin is very sensitive. I work with the Virginia Renaissance Fair, and we're outside in May and June when the sun is very bright and beats, and I get burned probably, I try not to get burned really well. I have a really big hat, <laughs> really, really big hat uh, that I wear, um, but hats are very important, and I, I really like hats. I really like wearing hats <laughs> because I can change the hat to go with my outfit. I can accessorize with that. But it is sometimes annoying that I have to think about, oh, do I have a hat to wear today? Did I remember to pack my hat if I stay the night somewhere? I used to travel for work. Did I remember my hat? Do I have to go find a store to buy a hat? Did I remember my sunscreen? 
did I remember my lotion? Because I'm very sensitive to different types of lotions, and I will break out, like Maria said. Um, so that's that's my two cents. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. I do want to ask really quickly for the 23% of you that mentioned other health effects that may be associated with their alopecia. Would you mind sharing what those health effects may be? I think we have a few hands that went up. Hi, I'm Margaret. I'm from Niskayuna, New York. And um, I've had alopecia for 71 years. Um, I got it when I was about 18 months old. And I really am concerned about the connection between thyroid disease, Hashimoto's syndrome, which I've had also since I was a child, and alopecia, because my son, who also has alopecia universalis, has had Hashimoto's since he was 10. At least that's when it was diagnosed. Um, and I just feel there's a really strong connection there, and it would be great because I, I can get I can get um, autoimmune um, blood tests for my thyroid. I've never had one for the alopecia, but I know my thyroid antibodies are through the roof. And when I do certain things, they come down. Like I, my, I'm seeing a functional doctor now, and I I've seen online a bunch of parents are putting their kids on gluten-free diets, and their numbers are coming down. So it's like I'd love to know if anybody's working on that connection because I really think there's, for people like me, it's a strong connection. I had the patchy alopecia until I was 18. And then during a stressful time in my life, bing, it was gone. It was all gone. And um, it was really, really hard to relate to everything everybody said. And when my son was 10 and got out a spot, you know, dot my other issues, doctors and how they relate to us, because they have no information, they have no good information, and they don't get training And what do you do when you've got a disease with no cure? And they say things like, well, what do you expect? That's who he's got for a mother. That's what they said to me. Um, and I read the other day, somebody told, some doctor told a woman that her child's hair is just going to grow back, so don't worry about it. And all of us who have have children with alopecia know lots of luck, lady. You know, what are the odds of that? So thank those you. are kind of my issues. And um, thank, thank you. you. I really appreciate what you're doing here today. Thank you. Thank you. And some of the comments that we heard, we did hear some frustration with diagnosis process and the lack of knowledge in the medical community. And this meeting is a platform that we can help communicate a little bit more about alopecia, Ariada. Um, other comments on the other health effects? Something other than thyroid disease, possibly? Jennifer here. Hi, my name's Jennifer. I have alopecia areata since I was 29. I'm 32 now. Um, some of the health concerns that I've seen from um, several dermatologists that I've visited have said that a couple of conditions that I have may have affected my alopecia. Um, I have celiac disease, and there's have said that there are little studies, but some have said that there is a connection. I also have endometriosis, and they have said that there is a connection possibly there. And I'm also deaf. And um, they have said there's probably a connection now. But also, wearing a wig and a cap is really hard because. It makes my hair nice to grow. It gives me a headache. And it's hard to even wear a wig because it sort of bunches up behind me and I really have no choice. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, I want to encourage all of you, we do have to move on from this question to another question, um, but I do want to encourage all of you to expand on everything that we've heard today here um, in the public docket comments, as we've mentioned. Um, please encourage uh, participation on the docket. Okay, so our next question, and we're going to do in a similar format, we're going to ask um, to hear from the pediatric and young adult folks first. What do you find to be the most bothersome impacts of your alopecia areata on your daily life? Please choose up to three answers. 
A, time or cost of daily maintenance. B, refraining from activities such as school, work, sports, or social activities. C, self-consciousness or embarrassment. D, bullying or discrimination. E, impact on relationships with family and friends. F, impact on intimate relationships. G, physical impact such as pain or difficulty concentrating. H, emotional or psychological impact such as anxiety, fear, depression. Or I, other impacts not mentioned. Okay, so we have an overwhelming majority, 81% who uh, selected that the most bothersome impact is the emotional or psychological impacts, followed by 67% who said self-consciousness or embarrassment. Um, in the 40, 40s, we have refraining from activities such as school, work, sports, or social activities, as well as bullying or discrimination. And then we have a a nice range in all of the other options as well. Um, I'd like to ask the adults in the room the same question now. Um, once again, what do you find to be the most bothersome impacts of alopecia areata on your daily life? And you can choose up to three answers for this question. Okay, um, some similarity. Also, in the 80%, we have H, which is the emotional or psychological impact, such as anxiety, fear, or depression, followed by self-consciousness or embarrassment. 37% um, for both refraining from activities as well as for impact on intimate relationships, um, which I think is uh, understandable. Um, I'd like to ask folks in the room to expand a little bit on the emotional or psychological impacts. Um, if you feel comfortable doing so, I think I'd like to hear a little bit from the pediatric or young adult perspective first, and then we'll follow with adults. That's OK. I see a hand right there. Hi, I'm Callie. Um, I am 28 years old, and I've had alopecia universalis since I was 18 months old. This is actually the first time I've ever really met anybody else with alopecia. Um, as a kid, uh, I can't even begin to describe the impact that it had on me growing up, the amount of bullying and torment I faced. Um, and I still deal with a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, you know, it's just, it's it's like indescribable, the um, amount of torment you face, as a child especially, but even as an adult. And you get it from other children, other adults. That's about it. Thank you. That's a very important point. Thank you for sharing. Let's go back. Sarah, I think we also have. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hi, again. Um, so um, being in high school right now, I'm pretty fortunate that I live in a town where it's like a small town, so I kind of know a lot of people. And um, I have a really good support system. Like my friends and my family are amazing. And I just know that, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, we had our first day of school. And just I just remember sitting in my room and like dreading it because I was like, great, I got to go meet new people again. I have new teachers who don't know what's going on. So I know that for me personally, that's a big thing. And um, 
going out in public, I told my mom this a while ago, but it's like you got to mentally prepare yourself for people to stare at you. Um, before I lost my hair, I had people stare at me because I'm mixed, and so my parents aren't the same race, and so people stared at me because of that, because I had, like, long, curly hair. and So people stared at me because of that. So I was used to people staring, but not having hair now, I'm a different kind of staring, and... Um, I find it funny with children. I find children like hilarious when they see me in stores because they're like, wait a minute, she doesn't have hair. And it's like, no, no, I don't. And trying to explain that to a child, it's just, I find children hilarious in stores. But um, just the emotional effect on it, on me personally, like I couldn't imagine going to a different school and being new and not knowing anybody at all who doesn't know what's going on in your life. So for me, that's a big part of it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think we have... Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Sangeeta. I'm Mega's mom. Um, as Mega said, uh, she got alopecia when she was in her first grade. Uh, it was kind of uh, very um, difficult for us uh, coming from India when I heard that she had alopecia. The first thing that I did is, oh, I'm in America. I have all the treatments available. And I went about searching about it. And also it was a, a, a lot of uh, turmoil for me to go through as a mom what the child is going through. And I didn't know that there is no cure. And um, so as soon as I found there was no cure, uh, first thing I did is I stopped all the activities for her because I didn't know what is going to be affecting it. And the next thing I did is uh, me and her teacher, Mrs. Alexander, we worked with her to counsel her to be a very strong person emotionally and psychologically in a sense that never get depressed or never do anything. Be a go-getter. Forget about anything in life. Uh, you are what you are and made her strong. Even though I, I know she's strong, there's always a part of her which suffer, uh, suffers and I mean, the psychological uh, thing, first time I went to the NAF conference in Los Angeles is when, when I saw all the kids in the swimming pool, everybody bald. I knew I'm not alone. <laughs> Thank you, Sangeeta. I'd like to hear a little bit about, oh, I see Sarah. Maybe we'll take one more. <laughs> okay. Hi, um, I'm Becca. Um, I'm 14 years old, and I just started my first year of high school, so I'm a freshman. Uh, it's hard to wake, wake up and have to go to school every day, because um, you know you're different. And uh, I play sports. I play volleyball and basketball. And even just walking onto the court, like going to school, I have my makeup, and I feel just a tad bit more beautiful, but it's still, I feel like I'm hiding myself from everyone. I can't wear my makeup on the court, so um, I automatically feel ugly and secluded. So it's scary just to walk out and practice. Um, and for games, it's even worse because the whole school's there and they see me without eyebrows and eyelashes. And I wear hats, but those are very hot. and I get extremely sweaty, and I have really bad heat waves on the court, which affects how I play. Um, and I just, every day, there isn't a day goes, that goes by that I don't wish I had my hair again, because I felt extremely confident with it. It was beautiful, curly brown hair, and I loved it. Um, and I just wish I had it back, because it just, it helps me. It would, it would help me every day just to go to school and to play sports. So thank you. Thank you, Becca. You are beautiful. I'd like to ask the adults in the room now a little bit uh, about their emotional or psych psychological impacts. And I'll ask you to keep one question in mind, which is, how have the impacts changed as you've gotten older? For example, has something has an impact become more bothersome as you've grown older, or maybe less bothersome as you've grown older? I think we have. Hi, I'm Miranda. Um, 
I've had patchy alopecia areata since I was five. Um, I do find that um, the issues I deal with as I've aged uh, change, although I still, um, I used to get haircuts, uh, well, until I was about eight. Um, and um, as a young adult, I know um, I have two sisters, and um, they both have uh, brown hair. Um, and so I, um, I noticed that uh, you know I was definitely very depressed. Um, I uh, I was a little, very hard on myself. I don't know. It's I think it's also part of the personality. Um, but I know um, I was uh, I uh, my parents were very supportive, but I isolated myself a lot. Um, actually, um, I know I suffered a lot with body image issues, and um, I was actually hospitalized for anorexia for a couple of years. And um, that definitely uh, was a very um, low point that I don't think I would have had if I was maybe more confident as a young adult and uh, didn't um, face like um, you know kids picking on me. <laughs> uh, but um, and that which also affected my family because parents have to treat you and take you to hot, you know, back and forth and visit you. So um, but as an adult, um, I'm working actually in Bethesda. I'm actually in the health research, um, and um, I, uh, I found that I've accepted um, my condition a lot more. Um, I do find that the wigs have made me more confident. I, I uh, definitely don't go in public uh, without one or not to a, a, na a National Patriotic Foundation uh, event. Um, I, uh, I do a lot of volunteering with them because um, up until I was out of college, uh, I avoided even the foundation because... I didn't want to face um, other people who were upset. Um, and um, uh, the wig has been very uh, helpful for me. Um, I have become very confident, but uh, I do, uh, it's like, you know, you cry a lot with this disease. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Do we have, oh, lots of hands. I'm going to let Pujita pick one. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try not to cry this time. Again, I'm Julie. The thing that you asked the question specifically, what's changed from when you were young to where you were an adult? And um, well, first of all, you know, like I've done a lot of personal growth. And what I've realized is that the emotional and psychological issues are not external. You know, like it actually comes from my immune system. And it, I, you know, like, as human beings, we tend to think that what we are thinking has something to do with what's going on around us and our environment. And then when you have reactions to life that have nothing to do with your environment, you have to question it. Research is now proving my point. You know, there's lots of new research that's coming out that's showing that the immune system is actually responsible for behavioral issues and behavioral side effects of health issues. And when you have chronic anxiety and chronic depression and you have chronic aggression and you have these things, they actually come from the immune system. And what I'm most afraid of about standing here in front of the FDA and talking and having all of us talk is that we're going to miss the point. This is not the hair disease. I'm afraid that we're going to sit here and we're going to talk about the symptoms of having no hair. I don't care if I have hair or not. Honestly, what I care about is that my immune system is fixed. I care that I'm not sick anymore. And I think that, you know, like, yes, did I get bullied when I was a little kid? Sure I did. It also made me the most confident person in the room because I was stronger than that, and I wasn't going to let my hair stop me. But, you know, like, that's not the point. The point is, is that we need research and solutions for an immune problem. And I literally, five years ago, was so sick that I couldn't stand up. Okay. Thank you, Julie. And I saved myself. Not one damn doctor did that for me. Not the FDA, 
not a doctor, not a drug company. I saved myself. I stopped eating gluten. I stopped eating tomatoes. I found the drugs. I found the supplements and the things that were going to change my life, and I did it. And I can't point the finger to anybody else that did that for me. So that's, that's now I'm can. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. And, and I'm very grateful for this panel. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity and the willingness of the industry to turn this around. So, Thank you. Thank you, Julie. We are cutting really close to our break time, so I'm going to quickly turn to Graham and Shannon and see what our webcast responses have been like. Similar to what we've heard in the room, anything different? So for the previous question, we did have some comments in regard to asthma, um, also experiencing allergies associated with food, and new episodes of patchy hair loss that specifically occur when getting sick. Um, for impacts, a lot of people discuss societal perceptions. One um, caregiver discussed her daughter being referred to as a boy on numerous occasions. Um, also, depression and anxiety were mentioned as well. A lot of adults mention anxiety with meeting new people and workplace discrimination and how there's been a shift in them caring more about how their peers feel about them versus their perception as, at work as they've gotten older. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I'm going to turn to my FDA colleagues here. Any follow-up questions at this point? No? Okay. Um, once again, I just want to do a quick plug-in for the docket comment reminder. I think we've barely scratched the surface as far as the daily impacts and what you guys experience day to day. So please go to the public docket and expand on what you've shared so far. Um, and quickly before we go to break, I have a couple of points I'd like to make. Um, one is that some of the topics that we're talking about today are sensitive, and one of the topics that we've heard and may continue to hear about is self-harm or suicide ideation. We want to remind you to seek any help if you need it. We have the information for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline up here on a slide, um, and we just want to put that out there. And one other announcement is the National Alopecia Areata Foundation has a couple of photographers here. And um, we didn't really allow them to come all the way up to the front because we didn't want them to disturb the meeting while we were proceeding. But if you're comfortable being in a photograph, they've asked that you kind of stay on the panel and where you are during the break, and then the photographer will be able to come up and take a picture. But it's at your discretion. If you don't feel comfortable doing so, you're more than welcome to take your break. And we'll see you guys back at 3 p.m. And if you are planning to get lunch, feel free to bring it into the room. This is a very uh, relaxed and formal setting. Thank you.